Welcome to video number two in the microfluidics course. Okay, so here's a breakdown of what we're going to be looking at in this video. And it's basically a brief discussion of the three papers that I assigned for you to read at the end of the last video, just giving sort of an overview of them and sharing some of the things that I really liked about them. And this is sort of like a one-sided version of the discussion that I would normally have with my students in class after they had read these three papers. Because these papers actually are sort of an important introduction to the course. Like they really show us the power of scaling and analysis and thinking small. And so we're actually going to use and build off some of the things that we cover in these papers. Okay, so the first paper I assigned for you to read in the last video is called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And it's written by Richard Feynman. And he's actually really insightful. If you haven't read any of his books or anything else from him, I strongly encourage that. He's a lot of fun to read. And this paper is no different. So if you haven't read it already, really, really encourage you to read it. It's really enjoyable. I'm just going to go over a few of the things that I really liked about this paper. So first, I love the tone of it. I love, so it's a, based on a talk he gave in 1959, December of 1959. And he's really encouraging people to explore things at a smaller scale. He wants to see if we can manipulate and control things on a very small scale. And he emphasizes that one of the points to doing this is that it would have a huge amount of applications, right? And so he goes through a whole bunch of examples and trying to encourage people to look at this and see that it's really exciting and really important. So just one of the first things I noted was he talked about how there were these devices so you could write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. I wasn't really familiar with that, so I looked it up. So here's an image of what that looks like written on the head of a pin there. I just thought that was neat to take a look at that. It's really incredible too how he talks a little bit about biomimicry, even though it's not called that at the time, in terms of storing information and just how incredible it is when you think about how much information DNA can store in such an incredibly small amount of space and how each of our cells has the complete code for the whole human body. There's a really interesting talk about this too. I've listed that here. It's by Riccardo Sabatini. That's a TED Talk and there's a title of it. So I encourage you to watch that. He also has a great explanation of how incredible the DNA code is. And he has it all there in a series of books. And that, that's a lot of fun to watch too. And so he sort of challenges us like, we could probably do better about storing information as well. I love how he talks about how we could understand things better by just looking at them and then really challenges us to make the electron microscope better. Because if you could if you could just look at things, if you could just see what, what's happening, it's so remarkable what you can learn from that, right? Talks about making computers smaller, which of course we've accomplished. And interestingly, he talks about the scaling, like how things behave differently differently at small scales. And we're going to look at that a lot in this course as well. You know, one example is where he says, you know, at these small scales, the heat escapes uh, so rapidly, right, that you might not even need to lubricate or you might not, you couldn't run a small internal combustion engine at this smaller scale because just how fast you have heat loss at, at this really small scale, right? That's the kind of thing we're going to be looking at. That's what's really cool about the small scale. He talks about how cool surgery would be if you could swallow the surgeon. And that's something today, even I know researchers are looking at how to sort of accomplish this with little nano robots and things like that. He also talks at one point about a really cool fabrication technique where you could evaporate things, right, in scaling down these computers. And so I put a little image here from a paper that I actually really likes. And some of my research has been in this field of evaporating sessile droplets. So shown here from this paper in 2014, actually, if you just change the properties of the droplet or how it evaporates, you can actually leave these different patterns here. When you place small particles in the fluid of the droplet and it evaporates, you can see all these different patterns here. You can accomplish just by changing changing the behavior of the evaporation. So we have this interesting way to control how things evaporate and then they leave the particles on the surface in this pattern, right? So if you could change that pattern, you could deposit these particles down in really interesting, neat ways. So you could make a very small scale uh, items just by doing it this way. So that's just one example there of, of what he was talking about. I think it's really cool. And then finally, I, I love the end of this paper, right? He has this challenge where he offers these uh, two prizes, right? These thousand dollar prizes. And one of them is to the first person who can make an operating electric motor Motor, which can be controlled from the outside and not counting the lead-in wires is only 1 64th of an inch cube. And the other one is uh, $1,000 to the first person who can take the information on the page of a book and put it on an area 1 25 thousandths smaller in linear scale and in such a manner that it can be read by an electron microscope. Okay, so I don't know if any of you looked this up when you read the paper, but I thought this was pretty cool. So the first prize uh, that was claimed was actually this small motor. And normally when I do this with my class, I ask them to guess when they think this was accomplished. So maybe take a guess right now before I tell you. You can even pause it if you want. So the motor didn't take very long at all. It was November of 1960 by William McClellan. Okay, so only about 11 months or so after the talk. Okay, now let's, again, try to guess when do you think the second prize was claimed? Take the information on the page of a book, put it on an area one, 25,000 smaller in linear scale. 
so it can be read by an electron microscope. This one was much later, much, much later. It actually took till 1985 by Tom Newman. Okay, so that's a, that's a long time, right? Roughly sort of 25 years later. It's incredible how, how different those two things are, but really cool. Okay, now I'll finish off this paper with a quote from it that I really love. He says, now you might say, who should do this and why should they do it? Well, I pointed out a few of the economic applications, but I know that the reason that you would do it might just be for fun, but have some fun. And I love that quote, right? Like, let's not forget part of the joy of these things, right? Is having some fun in our exploration. Okay, now the second paper I assigned also a lot of fun really encourage you to read this okay it's really impressive how bright these people are and how fun it is to read these so it's called life at low Reynolds number and same idea he's talking about things down at a really small scale this world that he calls a very low Reynolds number which is what this course is going to be looking at as well and it's life life at low Reynolds number right so Reynolds number we have is our ratio of inertial forces to viscous forces and his quote about this is great he says and Reynolds number of course is something for the engineers because he's a physicist, right? And so I love how this talk too is this physicist who's so delighted to talk about life, like the biological world, but also the engineering principles and how it relates. And so it's really great, like the way he talks about the Reynolds number, for example. Okay, so we can see he wrote it out here in a very small scale. This A is our length scale from whatever our object is there, right? So a very small length scale, that number becomes much, much smaller, right? He talks about how for a human swimming in water, Reynolds number might be about 10 to the four, but types of animals that he's talking about, it gets down to like 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, okay, really small. Like he showed one in this figure here, you know, where this length scale he's showing, right? That would be roughly one micron there. And he, he challenges us to, to think about what this means though, right? Not not just about the numbers, right? Or these dimensionless parameters, but to, to really feel what that feel so he he talks about how how it would feel like if like we were that small swimming at that scale like what does it mean to say like the viscous is so important these like viscous flows and i love that about this paper you know an example here is if he says uh if i have to push an animal to move it and suddenly i stop pushing how far will it coast before it slows down well for these things it would be about 0.1 angstroms which is actually a fraction of a nanometer and it would take about 0.6 microseconds to slow down okay so the, the this is how he helps us understand what it means, right? So that, that's what he means when he says inertia really plays no role whatsoever, right? What, whatever you're doing at, at that moment in time, okay, is completely determined by the forces that are exerted on you at that moment and nothing in the past. So you don't coast or glide or anything like that, right? If you, if you stop exerting that force, you stop immediately, right? So I, I just, I love that about this paper, how, how he pulls us into it, right? And this, this relates, this is also what we're gonna be talking about in this course, the power of really understanding and thinking about things at a small scale, because then we can design better things, right? If we understand it better. And he shows us, so at the right here, I'm showing this example where he had the Navier-Stokes equation, right? And so when these two terms don't matter, you have no time dependency in your equation anymore, right? Time doesn't matter. And he, he talks about the scallop theorem, okay? So the way a scallop swims, I've got a little picture here that I got from the web. It sort of slowly opens its shell and then quickly closes it and shoots this water out the back that gets it to move. I'll show a, a quick video of that here, just so you can see that. But that only works at the large scale or larger Reynolds numbers, right? So what he says is when you're down at small Reynolds number, that doesn't work anymore because, because time doesn't matter. Inertia doesn't matter. So if you open and close your shell, it doesn't matter what speed you do it at, right? You're just going to sort of move forward and backwards, right? What he calls a reciprocal motion because the faster moving fluid is not going to propel you forward anymore. And like, you're not even going to be able to move it that much faster. Okay. So what you have to do at the smaller scale is you have to make sure you have more than one degree of freedom. So he says the simplest animal that can swim is an animal with two hinges, right? And again, I encourage you to read it. It's, he's so good at explaining this, but I just, I love that. I love the scallop theorem. Okay. And so here it is. So here's where you have the two hinges, right? And he talks about how you can use this two degrees of freedom to actually move around. Even if you're at really low Reynolds number where inertia doesn't matter. You, ha you have to think of these really unique ways to swim, right? Like, like it's completely different at that scale, which is awesome. And I actually, it's hard to picture this. So I found a video. I'll, I'll play that video here. I found a video on YouTube that shows how this thing actually swims, you know what I mean? Like is able to move around just by using these, these two different hinges in the pattern that he shows here, which is really cool to see. 
And I just love, I love the tone that he's writing in as well, where he talks about how these flexible oars can help to swim. And he, again, same thing like Richard Feynman did, talks about how biology is so incredible, like how, how it's just fascinating that they figured these things out. And there's, there's so much we can learn from looking at them and mimicking them and what they do, right? I love my favorite quote is he says, now <laughs> he's talking about how your intuition about how a corkscrew swimmer would swim. And he says, now, unfortunately, it turns out that the thing does move the way your naive, untutored, and actually incorrect argument would indicate. But that's just a pedagogical misfortune we are always running into. Um, so again, the it's really fun paper to read, right? And he explains how the corkscrew can actually be used to help propel you at these really small scales, which of course is what the biological creatures do. And he goes on to make this incredible argument about efficiency, which I just love as well. And so he says, takes this little example of this little person like turning this corkscrew and, you know, imagines, uh, calculates how much the efficiency would be and said, it would only be about 1% percent propulsive efficiency which is really really low right uh but but actually his argument this actually doesn't matter right it doesn't matter at all it doesn't need to be efficient there's no like evolutionary pressure for it to be efficient but but why right that's not what we're familiar with and then he goes to on to explain that the energy required if the efficiency of propulsion is one percent is so low right half a watt per kilogram right to propel these creatures around it's so low that it doesn't matter at all like they have way more than enough food around them to cover this energy so to it doesn't matter at all. It's so little, right? I love his quote too. They're driving a Datsun in Saudi Arabia, right? Which is like a vehicle that was known for being efficient, right? And surrounded, of course, in Saudi Arabia by all kinds of gasoline, like all the gas it would need, right? So it's uh, it's just a funny, um, quirky way to explain it, right? And then he goes on to explain other reasons why the swimming is really not that important, okay? And I love how he looks at stirring versus diffusion. And this is where we get into the power of scaling these things. So this is really really sort of foreshadowing what we're going to look at in this course with this paper. It's like a perfect explanation of, of why the uh, small scale analysis we're going to look at is so powerful. Okay, because he talks about stirring versus diffusion. So the time for transport by stirring, all right, he figures out would be this time you transport something this distance L, okay, divided by the stirring speed, which is V, okay, but the time to transport by diffusion is actually this L squared divided by D, which is your uh, diffusion coefficient. And so basically when you compare the two times, a time to transport by diffusion, and you divide that by your time to transport by stirring, that works if it's greater than one, right? Then stirring would actually matter. You want the time to be smaller, right? So the time for stirring was in the denominator. So if that's smaller, that number will get bigger, right? So that's saying like that's when stirring is important or it actually matters. And he makes up this coefficient for it called S and goes on to say, well, okay, but at the scales we're looking at, at these creatures that we're looking at, S is 10 to the negative two. So there's actually no point at all. Local stirring accomplishes nothing, right? It's way more effective to just sit there and wait for diffusion to give you all the, the food that you need. And he talks about how this is really, it goes against our instincts, right? So it's this fascinating physical argument he makes. And then he goes on to say, well, but it feels like we, we should want to move to collect more food, right? And shows actually that at this scale, comparing the diffusion, I've got this figure on the right for that, in order to increase your food supply by 10%, you'd have to move at a speed of 700 micrometers a second, which is 20 times faster than it can actually swim. It doesn't need to move to collect food, but some of these creatures do move. So he goes on to say, well, why? Right? And he says, what you can do is actually find places where the food is better or more abundant. Okay. And so he looked at this experiment that was run to try to figure out what was actually going on with these uh, little animals. And it's sort of incredible how the, the scaling argument really predicts what's what's physically happening. Okay. So he looks at um, how far they'd have to move to outswim diffusion, right? So what you're looking for is you want to swim far enough that you can tell if you're in an area with more more food, a higher concentration of food or better food, right? And so to outswim diffusion, he says, he does a calculation with the scaling analysis and says, you have to go at least 30 microns to outswim diffusion. Again, by looking at these ratios, by going this distance D over V, right? And if he says, if you don't swim that far, you haven't really gone anywhere, right? Because you haven't overcome the diffusion. And then when you look at this experiment, right, that shows this 50 micron length scale, that's roughly how far they're traveling, right? And he sort of guesses that an algorithm these animals might be using, right, is that 
if things are getting better, you sort of keep swimming for longer. And if things are not improving, you got to at least go this distance 30 microns to sort of figure that out, right? And so if you sort of kept swimming a little bit longer in each case where it was improving, you'd end up sort of slowly moving yourself into a place where it was better, right? Anyways, <laughs> fascinating article. I love, love how he does this. And it's just really interesting way to sort of introduce what we're going to be talking about in the course. Amazing paper. Strongly encourage that you read it. Okay. And then the third one I recommended uh, is again, a little more recent. 2006 paper by George Whitesides called The Origins and the Future of Microfluidics. And so, again, what I think is really neat is to look at in 2006, sort of the state of where things were for microfluidics. And again, how he was sort of encouraging us to use our imagination and see where this field could go. And he talks a lot about how much potential microfluidics has, but how it hadn't really sort of lived up to that potential yet in terms of like exploding into these numbers of applications because it's so powerful, right? Like he really asked the question, like what would it take to get it to be uh, used more? right? Or applied more. And it's interesting. I put a picture here actually of the tricorder from Star Trek, because that's what I always think of when I think of like futuristic, you know, healthcare technology. And he shows a little device here when you can do this fluid handling on a very small scale, how it really expands what you can learn about, you know, what's going on in the human body. He shows this figure here, which is also really neat in terms of making things you have a high degree of control over, like manipulating these multi-phase flows, because you can make very highly controlled like emulsions or foams, you know, where you see these little bubbles here that you have a lot of control over. So you can make materials with very precise properties potentially, right? And I love, so this argument that he says is above all, it must become successful commercially rather than remain a field based on proof of concept demonstrations and academic papers, which I really agree with, right? That's where we sort of really see the impact. And that's what he's really sort of challenging us to think about and to imagine some applications where we could really see this thing take off. You know, he mentions, he talks about this killer app, which is that sort of first thing where we're going to see microfluidics is really valuable. And those initial costs and risks, because you have this high value, are really worth taking. And so that really helps kickstart the technology, you know? And I love, again, how he talks about healthcare and where we're sort of moving into with healthcare, where he says healthcare will move from treating to anticipating disease. Widespread sensitive frequent screening or testing will be a necessity for such anticipatory healthcare. And microfluidic systems are the most plausible technology for such testing. Yeah, I love that as well, right? Let's not just treat problems after they happen, but let's see if we can predict them, right? So if you're recording the state of your body, like before you get cancer, like potentially that could help us to like prevent getting these diseases at all, right? Which is really cool to think of. And if you had a simple microfluidic device, we could sort of be scanning the state of people's bodies, right? By taking, you know, blood samples or sweat samples or whatever and track these things, right? And figure that out. And I just, I love that. I love the potential in that, right? And so again, I really strongly recommend you read this paper. That's just really sort of brief overview. There's a lot more things that he talks about and that all of them talk about in their papers. And it's really sort of sets the stage for what we're going to be looking at in this course. Okay, so that's where I'm going to end this video. This was just my sort of summary of these three papers, which I strongly encourage you to read. So it's sort of like a one-sided version of the discussion I would have with my class about these papers after they read them. And in the next video, we're going to go on and do some dimensional analysis. Okay, thanks for watching.